morning, Long Island, and welcome to CMM Live. It is Tuesday, May 29th, Tuesday after a beautiful, it's a beautiful day after the not so beautiful Memorial Day. Uh, my name is Joe Campo, I'm your host, and here on CMM Live, uh, we try to help Long Island thrive by introducing all of our viewers uh, to the folks here on Long Island who are working hard to make a difference, the best and the brightest in critical issues. Today's issue is about uh, security, cybersecurity, and other sorts of security and authenticity, which probably 10 years ago most of us thought was just somebody else's problem. And now we're realizing that it's a, it's a worldwide problem, it's a global problem. And today we're going to be talking to folks here on Long Island who are really working hard to effectuate change uh, in these markets and that happen to be here on Long Island. Our first guest is uh, Dr. James Hayward. He's the president and CEO of Applied DNA Sciences. For those of you who don't know Jim, he is really one of Long Island's best kept uh, secrets. I've known him for about uh, 10 years, I'd say over the last year or so, our, we've developed our relationship a little bit stronger. And the more I get to know him, uh, the more impressed I am, uh, not only just about his talents, but that he's here. He's here on Long Island, and he's chosen to make Long Island his, his home. Uh, he's created such a tremendous company. And I'm so happy to be spending time uh, with him today. So, Jim, welcome to the uh, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's really an honor to be here. Well, it's all, the honor's all ours. You know, one of the things I love so much um, about uh, you know the talent here on Long Island is they always have a very interesting story about how they've how mm -hmm. they've gotten here. And I know you're a modest guy, and I know you don't want to spend a lot of time, but you have to tell us the story. I mean, you started. Uh, you know, my notes tell me you started at your family's uh, general store, uh, a deli in Queens, mm -hmm. and now you're one of the leading global scientists in this in this space. So, how does that happen? What was your what was your journey, and and, and what was your path? Sure, we uh, operated a family business behind a deli and and lived behind the deli in the south of Queens, and the. Uh, the work ethic that we all learned, we learned from just about the time we could walk. By the time you could walk, you could peel the onions, and, uh, or you could sort the newspapers. And so I thank my mother and father, really, for instilling a work ethic at a very early age. Then I did my undergraduate degree in the state system here in New York in both biology and chemistry at Oneonta, and came to Stony Brook where I did my PhD in molecular biology. And then ended up uh, going to the UK for a postdoc. And uh, my wife had a much better job in New York, so we agreed, well, I'll go for a year and uh, get the experience I needed. But an opportunity to create a new company arose, and uh, if there's a talent I really have, it's choosing my friends well. And so I uh, befriended the mentor I went to work with, and he and I together started a company, and in about uh, three years ended up taking it public, and it uh, went public at a very high valuation. And more than 40 years later, it's still on the footsie. So that was a, a great, great teaching experience. Yeah, so it's rare and so for our viewers to understand how rare it is to have a scientist who actually understands business and how to commercialize um, their inventions. That's truly a very rare package. And I think that's what you know, has always attracted me to Jim. You know, we do a lot of work with the, with, with the university in terms of licensing IP that folks have created or technology, mm -hmm. but you've really learned how to commercialize it. And you know, Applied DNA, your company, it's a NASDAQ listed company. It's one of the most innovative companies, you know, not just here on Long Island. You happen to be headquartered here on Long Island, but it's, a, it's a, an innovative worldwide company. So tell us about it. Tell, tell us about Applied DNA. Sure. Well, at the center of uh, Applied DNA's technology platform is our capacity to manufacture DNA a completely different way uh, than it has been manufactured for the last, since the 1990s. And that method involves uh, something called polymerase chain reaction, more science probably than you bargained for, or PCR, 
Okay. And many people have, know it as PCR, and it's an iterative process, and with every iteration, which takes just a minute or two, the quantity of DNA in the system doubles. So you can imagine after 30 iterations, you have just about increased the quantity of a specific DNA about a billion fold. Very, very pure, very, very fast, and you can bring it to uncannily large scale. And so it opens up all new opportunities for DNA that we might not have seen if the scalability hadn't been discovered at applied DNA. That's terrific. What was the first application? So when you first realized that this scalability factor um, was, was present, what was the first commercial application that you thought you'd be able to, to utilize? Yeah, we got involved with the Department of Defense rather quickly. And so DOD was having a problem with counterfeit chips uh, coming into their supply chain. And God help them, if those counterfeit chips are installed in a weapon, they could very much affect their war fighters. So um, we developed an approach to be present when the chip was more or less born. And if we were there, we could validate that it was an original. We were at the plant when it was born, and we can tag it. So we developed a method of tagging that could follow that chip through every node of the supply chain until it arrived at DOD or the Defense Logistics Agency and eventually the Missile Defense Agency in order to be able to assemble that into a weapon. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, folks don't realize, or maybe they do, just how many billions of dollars, right, get lost in counterfeit goods, counterfeit supplies. So it's not just security oh, issues, which are incredibly crazy. It's also just supply chain authenticity across all different markets that you guys are involved in. Sure. Some people feel that the impact on the global economy this year has exceeded $1.8 trillion, wow. and that um, it's costing at least five and a half or six million jobs. Yeah, so it's really, really critical work that you guys are, are doing. So one of the things that you did is a, is a geotyping um, program, right? It's a beta program that you guys rolled out this year. Um, talk, about, talk about that. I, I have some information and some, uh, some experience with it, but talk about that because I think it's really interesting stuff. Sure. Well, this relates to our ability to really uh, clean up the global cotton supply chain which when we first investigated was desperately in need of cleaning up. For example, in the United States, there are two species of cotton. There's a Pima cotton, which is the higher quality cotton, and it sells as a raw material at a much higher price than does the upland cotton. But if you ship Pima offshore, what returns to the U.S. as finished goods and labeled 100% Pima is much more than the U.S. ships offshore. So obviously it's growing in volume somehow, somewhere, and we decided to take a look at how. So the first thing we did was develop an assay that would allow us to look at a particular kind of DNA inside the cotton fiber that nature provided when the fiber was growing. And we could identify that fiber and speciate the cotton so we knew whether it was the good cotton or the bad cotton in a very simple test we called fiber typing. But the world had more complex problems than that. So for example, in Uzbekistan, almost all of their cotton is collected by uh, people who are suffering human rights abuses, who are forced into the field for a season at a time. Well, you can imagine that cotton, although it's high quality, is very inexpensive. And when large companies, European or American, put 
a large amount of pressure on the supply chain for their cotton, wanting for a brand to get very cheap product to be returned, the manufacturers, the spinners, the weavers, the fabric finishers, the dyers, all of those folks, which are all separate entities, separate companies, often in separate, separate countries, look for ways to increase their margin, even by cheating, as long as they can remain within the technical spec of the product. So Uzbeki cotton finds its way into places where federal law in the United States and in the UK, and now it's just happening in Australia, absolutely prevents under serious punishment the entry of any of those fibers on finished goods, but I guarantee those fibers are on the runway. Yeah, it's so interesting to me. I find this whole topic fascinating. I just watched a documentary called Sour Grapes, and it was about the, you know, the, the fraud in the wine industry where mm -hmm. people were just counterfeiting wines and, and trying to knock off. It's everywhere. It's prevalent and it's unbelievable. You can see it in olive oil. You can see it in cheeses. You can see it in the worst case, of course, is medicines. There is an estimate that perhaps as many as 700,000 people may have died last year from counterfeit medicines. Now, if you took that incident rate, never mind, that's the mortality, never mind the morbidity. If you took that incident rate and you looked at the cost on the medical infrastructure mm -hmm. of bearing that, that would be way up there with the medical indications like uh, cancer or uh, other diseases that governments are intent on squashing. And this problem of counterfeit pharmaceutics has been around a very long time. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to me. So what's the, what's the process, right? What's the heart of your technology? What's the heart of your guys' process that you're able to do this? Because for you know, a poor country lawyer like me, I can't even fathom how you guys have done this. So maybe you can talk about that a bit. Sure. Well, there are a few qualities about DNA that your audience may not realize. The, the first is it's imminently detectable. It is perhaps the most detectable analyte there is in the physical world because of the nature of the assay. Yeah. So that being the case, it means you only have to tag with very, very low levels. We tag, for example, cotton with one part per trillion. So the DNA is practically not there, yet we can assure the origins by tagging cotton with one of our signature tags, as we call them, and um, being able to track that back to the point of origin or being able to track back a specific claim for that cotton because this approach is also helpful in supply chains where you may want to make a claim that's almost impossible to test. So for example, um, sustainable products. How do you test for sustainability? You really can't. But if we're there when an NGO says this product was made sustainably, then uh, we can tag it with a mark that implies that same thing. Or whether it says it's been ethically sourced, for example, has no Uzbek cotton in it, then that test uh, can, that mark can provide those results. And the beauty of these marks is unlike a certificate of analysis or a bill of lading, which is a document that travels away from the product right. that can be fraudulently modified. Our DNA travels in or on the product. It can't be changed and it, it can't be corrupted. That's been proved. So um, it's a very novel application. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So, you know, most of us know DNA from uh, CSI, from mm -hmm. crime fighting, you know, and business leaders will always say, um, you know, the DNA of their company or it's in my DNA. So from the general public's perspective, DNA is some, some powerful stuff in those marketplaces. But has that helped you? Has that created challenges for you? How has that affected how your company's shaped? Sure. So 
Lots of people see DNA as a cultural aspect of either their family or their nation or their company. Um, and certainly in a family it will show the heritable qualities, but it's not going to show much about the quality of a company. There's no such thing as the DNA of, of your company. But there's another aspect of DNA which is extremely intriguing and that is called synthetic genomics, which is also what we do. And in synthetic genomics, you can encrypt content. And you know what binary code is, sure. and in binary code, you have a bit with two options, and it's a lineal sequence of bits. And you store your content that way. You store your book that way if you're keeping it on your iPhone. With DNA, you have four options per bit, C, T, G, and A. And with those options, you now have the square of the content. You have much more content. So much so that as little as four grams of DNA, literally a teaspoon, would hold all the content in the world as of 2011. It's almost uh, difficult to think about. Yeah. And so with that content, you can begin to do lots of additional things with DNA tagging beyond simply proving origin or provenance or originality, authenticity. You can also provide much more sophisticated claims. Yeah, it's great. My, I remember as an undergraduate in Stony Brook, I read The Double Helix, and that was my first introduction to, uh, to DNA. And I've heard you talk about Long Island having a DNA corridor, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you can talk a little bit, talk a little bit about that, because I think it's really an interesting story. Sure, we should be really very, very proud of it. And incubators, you've had guests here before to speak about incubators. Incubators are often uh, circled around major research institutions and universities. And here on Long Island, we've had a similar effect. We've had Brookhaven National Lab. We've had Cold Spring Harbor in the other direction. Of course, we've had Stony Brook. We've had the Feinstein Institute and others. And uh, as it turns out, the focus that much of those institutions have involves DNA. So that there is a professional pool in this community of what is probably the best DNA workers in the globe. So this is a perfect location for applied DNA to locate itself. So was that, was that why you chose to locate here? Or was that kind of like, hey, this is kind of cool that I chose to locate here? Was that a driving force? No, it was certainly one of the driving forces. But for me, another driving force is I'm very attracted to the notion of business incubators and their association with campuses. Another great quality that it conveys in hiring is that new, newly minted PhDs, for example, can participate in the academic aspects, the academic calendar on campus, go to seminars, visit with famous scientists who are coming to the campus, take courses. And it also allows us as a company to bring in interns to kind of pay back to the campus and give the interns an opportunity to learn for the summer. We do that even with postdoctoral interns. So there's a lot of give and take. And the same is true in, in uh, instrumental, institutional resources, electron microscopes, NMR machines, things like that, that for a small biotech company, access to them can make the world a difference. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish on, uh, on this area. I'm very bullish on Stony Brook. And, you know, part of, um, part of my hypothesis about the growth of Long Island is I look at Silicon Valley, which used to be called the Stanford Industrial Park, mm -hmm. until a little silicon chip came along. And then the collaboration between those companies and the university really made that the Silicon Valley that it is today. I look at you know what you're talking about here now, and I never really thought about it before because 
um, you know, Cold Spring Harbor Lab was instrumental with DNA. We, we could have that same sort of universal swelling in the area of, of DNA and authentic, authenticity right here on Long Island in collaboration with Stony Brook. How can we do that better, though? As a, as a company that's been partnered with Stony Brook, how can we strengthen that partnership so other folks can help add into this robustness? Sure. Well, for example, tomorrow we have, uh, is it tomorrow? No, the day after, an HIA trade show. Yes. But bringing companies through the area who are here to shop. So in our case, part of what we develop is directly relevant to pharmaceutic companies. Biotech companies rarely take those products, those drugs for example, to the market themselves. Instead they license to pharmaceutic companies. We have to have an environment in which those pharmaceutic companies are here shopping and uh, where the region markets the assets to those customers. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You got some other cool stuff going on. So we talked about we talked about cotton, we talked about some DOD stuff. What are some other what are some other areas that you guys are uh, are in or looking at because sure. I think it's great stuff. Sure. In the case of supply chains, which we think is very very important. It's our number one issue. We want to get that to market in as many opportunities as we can as quickly as we can. But because we're unusual in our capacity to manufacture and formulate DNA, we can also make DNA which has a biological function. And there are new therapies like immuno-oncology in the treatment of uh, tumors by mobilizing the patient's own immune system. And our DNA systems can play a very central role in that as well. So we're... Um, kind of, of juggling the lesser regulated or non-regulated applications like ensuring cotton and fertilizer supply chains are intact with the highly regulated supply chains like ensuring pharmaceutics are intact or that we participate in the development of brand new drugs based on functional DNA. Yeah. So supply chain and authenticity and security are you know are gaining new notoriety now because of blockchain that's out there mm -hmm. and and i never really thought about it until i was thinking more deeply about your company and what we we're going to talk about today and it, it still seems to me and you know what do i know but it still seems to me that because of the actual you know there's no human error when it comes to dna you know, DNA is going to be DNA, and it's so scientifically accepted, it is what it is. Even with blockchain and my limited knowledge of it, there is human interaction and human error that can occur in the authenticity of blockchain. So how has, you know, this new thing called blockchain, which isn't that new, but it's new to the public, how has that, you know, helped, hurt, affected your way of thinking? How has it impacted the company? Talk about that a little bit. Sure. We actually see blockchain <laughs> as a wonderful opportunity for us to interface with companies that are really emphasizing blockchain as their primary offering, in particular in supply chains. Where, supply, where blockchains could go terribly wrong is imagine if the information at the very top of the blockchain, before it's entered into a distributed journal, is incorrect. It's incorrect because it's a counterfeit item. And now the blockchain could inadvertently support the distribution and validation of really contraband. So we believe that there has to be a very strong connection at the top end of the blockchain between the digital world and the real world. And that connection should be in the form of a forensic authentication of the data, the product it represents, before the first element of the blockchain hits the ledgers. Yeah, and I, I, I'm still trying to understand blockchain. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, it's, I think it's a great idea. I'm still trying to understand it. Um, but I'll tell you, even in the legal community, DNA is so uh, easily authenticated and so core to, to us that I think it just gives people more comfort when DNA 
matches rather than mm -hmm. it being matched on the blockchain. I think it's going to take a while. Well, that definitely helps us in our sales cycle for the authentication side of the business. So many people are familiar with CSI. So many people are familiar with the value of uh, DNA in the courts that um, it doesn't take much convincing. And just to give you an example, one of the industries we're in, especially in the UK, less here in the United States, is protecting the movement of cash, especially to ATMs. And uh, what happens very often in the UK is because there are no weapons on those guards, it's very easy for uh, those guards to be robbed with someone who doesn't represent the kind of threat that in the United States an armed guard would take as serious. Yeah. So, uh, for example, the robbery rate of, uh, of security trucks is about uh, 50 from coast to coast in the United States per year, 50. Wow. Because you'd have to be crazy to approach one of those vehicles with gun ports all over it. Right. In the UK, there were 1,000 just a couple of years ago in the city of London alone. And so we have an opportunity there, and our DNA is actually used in those ATMs. It's deployed when the ATM is robbed, and it's resulted in about 160 cases now before the Crown Prosecutor. Of those, 117 have actually gone to trial, and we have 117 convictions. That's 100 percent. Yeah, that's that's really fantastic. We have, we have time for one more question, and it's it's an important question to me because the more I think about the value you guys offer in terms of, you know, if I'm a business owner creating a certain product that I want to make sure remains pure in the marketplace. You know, and I may have intellectual property to protect it, but I have to resort to the courts, and I got to pay lawyers, and I got to do all this stuff. You guys really, from an IP perspective, are able to give a lot of safety, security, and comfort just in knowing that it's authenticity. What is what you know? What is your relationship with and your philosophy regarding intellectual property and how it all ties together? Oh, it's really essential. And you have to imagine the response. When we go to visit a large blue chip company and propose a solution for a problem they have using our framework, their imaginations catch fire. And they're uh, very, very enthusiastic. We have to be sure that before we go to that customer, we understand the customer completely. and that we have already established the IP to protect our applications for that customer. So we uh, have spent a lot of money on our IP. We have um, well over 100 patents in total, about uh, 65 of those issued and the remaining pending. And uh, it will remain a very important part of our strategy. Now beyond patents, Trade secrets are also a very important part right. of an IP estate, and we manage those just as enthusiastically. That's terrific. So, Jim, thanks for joining us, folks. I hope you realize what a rare treat it was to have uh, Dr. James Hayward here, President and CEO of Applied DNA Sciences. They're a publicly traded company on the on the Nasdaq Exchange. Jim, what's the uh, what's your symbol? APDN. APDN. Check it out. Uh, you heard it here on CMM Live, and Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Joe. Absolutely. Folks, welcome back to CMM Live. It is Tuesday, May 29th. I am Joe Campoli, your host. We just had an incredibly great segment with uh, Dr. Jim Hayward from Applied DNA, where we talked about security from a supply chain perspective and weeding out uh, all those people out there that are knocking off goods and causing security threats because of non-authentic 
goods. Very important, interesting stuff. We're now going to turn to, uh, you know, more security issues, cybersecurity. And to talk about that today, we're joined with our good friends, uh, Marty Schmidt and Kevin Edwards from, uh, from Flexible. Everybody on Long Island knows Flexible. It's a, it's a fantastic business. Everybody, uh, everybody knows you guys. They talk about you guys. We've known each other a while. And I'm so impressed with everything that you guys are, uh, are up to. And sometimes it's good to be lucky as well, right? In today's day and age with, uh, with cyber and cybersecurity, you probably couldn't have imagined. How long have you guys been doing this now, Marty? C cyber or been in business? Been since, in business. Uh, 1984. 1984, right? So pre, way pre-internet, yeah. way pre all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to all the good stuff. Um, so tell us about the beginning. Tell us uh, you know, how it all started, where the brainchild came from. So uh, I and my two partners have been in business since 1984 together. It's um, amazing, a long time. It's huh? a very long time to yeah. be with, with those people, and it's a great partnership. And we started, um, we came out of Stony Brook. Uh, my two partners were uh, doing computer support uh, at their respective companies, and they decided that they were learning more than what the manufacturers knew. Uh, so they thought that it would be a good idea to start a business where we could support other users of computing across Long Island. I graduated college and came on board right around 1985. And since then, we've been supporting the Long Island business community. That's terrific. And Kevin, when did you, uh, when did you join Flexible? What's your background as well? Uh, my background's a little, uh, a little different than how you typically get to where we are. But I came out of the marketing and advertising uh, arena. Uh, but uh, actually started my own business from that uh, for developing software and after a, uh, a couple of years of doing that I sold the company and then met Marty uh, actually seven years ago I believe uh, today. Wow. Uh, been with Flexible for seven years. You heard years. it here folks. There you go. Seven years ago an today. <laughs> So we met each other and we realized there was connection and at that time I was really involved with medical practice technology and uh, it all worked out and here we are today and that's just grown into what it is today especially on the cyber side with us and helping medical practices was our first area of diving into the cyber realm <laughs> yeah it's just grown I've been watching you guys grow now it's let's see let's make sure we have about 125 employees which is incredibly uh, impressive you've outgrown your Oso Avenue facility in the Hot Bog Industrial Park that you moved into only in 2014, yes. right? So the growth is, uh, is, must be driving you crazy. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, but I understand that it drives you, drives you crazy. And you guys are purchasing a new facility now. We are. We're uh, going on to Motor Parkway, uh, about 40,000 feet, and uh, that's to accommodate the large amount of growth that we've had, especially as it pertains to managed services. Yes, yeah, so managed services is sort of your bread and butter services, right? Yes. And how's that, how has that grown? So, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you honestly, when, you know, I think 10 years ago people didn't think they needed it. Now nobody can live without it, right? So how has that industry changed and grown? So we find more and more small businesses want to partner with an organization like us. They need a company to help them understand the strategy, where to go. Uh, how they can apply technology to their business, better apply technology to their business, and where at one point years ago we were responding and taking care of projects for clients. Now it's more that clients are looking for a partner, somebody that can help them use technology the right way. And then the other part of our business is we also support IT people. So when they have a la carte services that they need done, whether it be some kind of complex project or something that they don't have time to do or don't have the resources to do, uh, we'll help IT people as well. So we not only help uh, business owners and business people, uh, we help IT people too. Yeah, and it's, it, I'll tell you, it's gotten so frustrating and so aggravating, the, the myriad of things that have to happen for just technology to work in an office place. So the way the software companies do their upgrades, the way everything, servers get outdated, you know, everything happens. So how do you guys, you know, how do you guys approach it in terms of managing that efficiently for your clients? Because it's all about efficiency, right? It, it is, and we find that working off a technology plan is the best way to go. So we'll come into a new situation and we'll understand where they're at now and where they need to be. And then we'll work off of what we call a technology plan to make sure that we 
are adhering to uh, the steps that we feel are necessary to get the client where they need to be and get them to a point where uh, they don't need um, a myriad of support calls and that kind of thing. Yeah, I loved it. When we were in your offices a couple of weeks ago, you said a good day is when the phone's not ringing, and I can, I can understand that. Because when your phones are ringing a lot, it means something bad is going on somewhere, right? That's exactly it, and we don't feel like clients should be paying us to respond. We feel like clients should be paying us to make sure that they have the proper working network, that there is no reason to make phone calls and be in a response-oriented situation. Right. So, Kevin, you came, uh, you said, out of marketing and you sold a business, and now you're one of Long Island's leading cybersecurity experts and responders. You know, how did that, how did that happen? How, do, how did you get there? You know, was yeah. it supply and demand that you just immersed yourself into it? How did that all occur? A little bit of both. Um, in the beginning, it was working with um, a lot of our medical clients and with Things the like HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA and and regulations. Like that, yep. And they needed help with that. And also uh, with industry, within the industry of uh, PCI compliance with the credit card industry. So we saw the need that these clients not only need to have the administrative piece, which is your policies and procedures, but they also need to address the technical and physical safeguards to ensure they're meeting the regulations. So over the years, it's kind of morphed. And as the HIPAA thing was growing, everything was moving towards that, we started getting, like over the transom, uh, other clients coming to us say, hey, can you help us with this? Can you help us with this regulation that I'm getting from um, my vendor that wants me to adhere to these strict uh, risk assessments? And so we kind of morphed into opening it up to this full risk assessment offering, the security and compliance offering um, to help these businesses navigate what the industry is actually dictating them to do. Yeah, where I find you guys to be incredibly important to the Long Island community, especially is your responsiveness. Okay, so we've worked together where clients, particularly clients in sensitive industries, have been hacked, sensitive data has potentially been breached, and you guys are Johnny on the spot. You really are. It's, 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 it's so great to work with partners where you can call them and they take it seriously and it's, and it's responsiveness that's there. But how do you deal with talent? So how are you finding the talent, right? How are you making sure that you have the skill sets for all these things that are changing and growing and, and, and really putting risk into, into companies? It's got to be a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. Um, and the people that work on, so it, within our organization on the security team, we do have a team dedicated to be that responsive team and an incident response team. So if we get the call at two o'clock in the morning that there's something going on and they need assistance right away, that team ju you know, jumps in there. All the people on that team are dedicated security analysts. They want to do this. They love what they do and they're so immersed in the, the understanding of it from the technical side, from the policy procedure side, that you know, when we're looking for those people to join the team, we have to, they have to actually show us how vested they are, because having people on the team that aren't invested in taking the time to understand all the new regulations coming down, understand the threats that are coming in from the you know the uh, unethical hackers out there and such, and being on the forefront, um, that's how that's the kind of people that we're looking for to bring on our team, and we're blessed to have these these people on our team that are just dedicated to understanding how they can help our clients. Yeah, you guys are you're really, uh, really terrific. That's uh, from direct knowledge, working with some of our good clients, which is, you know, really important. Well, Joe, one thing that we do see also is, yeah, we have the responsive team and all of that, and when we need to remediate and fix issues, that kind of thing, we do. Uh, we also find a lot of organizations that just aren't prepared and haven't planned the right way. And we're amazed sometimes that even when there's maybe an IT person on staff or an IT company that that organization is already working with, that they miss a lot of steps that could have been taken to avoid these situations. So we're, that's very prevalent. We see it all the time. Yeah, I remember when I was in in college at Stony Brook. It's like a Stony Brook love fest here today. I yeah, love it. it. Is, I, I, right. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. The SUNY system. I was, yeah. uh, I sold computers and other things at Radio Shack. It was the, the era of the 286 computer. It was a big deal. Then a 386 and a 46. But I always got really sad when folks would come in and say, I need a home security system. And I'd say, oh, you got robbed, huh? And they would come in and then it was, uh -huh. you know, from a salesman's perspective, it was terrific because all of a sudden now you'd sell them a whole security system rather than preventive stuff. 
You know, and what I tell folks is if they don't invest in a good IT platform and good IT professionals, they're going to wind up being those same people that I serviced at Radio Shack because they're going to come to you guys and say, we got hacked, we got totally screwed, we have ransom or whatever is going on, and now we got to redo everything. And it's probably much more expensive at that point for them to, you know, for them to do it. So I'm a huge proponent of somebody coming in and making sure that their platform is professionally done from the beginning because it's going to cost them less, mm -hmm. you know, down the road. And that's where it really starts with the risk assessment, you know, having an organization understand that they need to look at what the potential risks are to the organization, having a company come in where we can uncover the technical and the physical vulnerabilities, the administrative vulnerabilities. You, you know, a lot of times when we go in there, we find that they don't have the basic policy procedures in place. They have no training in place. So the weakest link in any organization is your end user, you know, clicking on malicious links and, and downloading things to their devices. So you can have the best antivirus and, and firewall in place, but if someone goes and actively downloads a malicious piece of software, unbeknownst to themselves, they're not trying to hurt the company. You know, it starts with that training as well. Yeah, where I also... Um First hand watched you guys, and it also really impressed me was <clears throat> Superstorm Stan Sandy. So Superstorm Sandy businesses lost, you know, complete access to their to their networks. And there was a client of yours, in fact, with Serenian Associates. We were in their building. There was a client of yours, and you guys were hands on trying to find workarounds, trying to find ways for them to keep up and running, uh, to be able to drive their businesses and I was super impressed with how you guys um, handle that you know and so it's always been very important but you know talk about that that must have been a very challenging time for you guys after storms like that hit and, and we lose stuff. It was and it's another good example though that planning is so important and planning the right way and making sure that you have systems in place that can be support, supported by a situation like that. So, it, it, you know, it's one thing to respond and do all the things we can to put systems in place and, and have space for people to work in through something like Sandy. Uh, it's another thing, though, to, to properly plan your network so that you're in a position to be able to pretty easily transport over to some other method of doing your work, whether it's at a hotel or in our space, our office. That, that means phones, servers, applications, making sure that you're backed up, making sure that you're embracing or figuring out some type of cloud uh, strategy so that you can pretty easily move into, you know, different space and come up as fast as possible. Yeah, really, really important stuff for, uh, for businesses. Now, I know you guys are um, not, your clients just aren't on Long Island, but you're based here on Long Island and you're based in the Hop Hog Industrial Park and you know that I have a love for the Hop Hog Industrial Park, how could you not, with 1,400 businesses there, right? Talk about, um, talk about the Long Island market. Talk about, you know, you, you've chosen now to, you know, to buy a building right there in the heart of the industrial park. What do you see happening on Long Island, you know, and how do you see that being able to help grow your business there? So when you look at Long Island and you look at the types of businesses on Long Island, most of them are small to mid-sized businesses, and most of them are of the, let's say, the 50 user size or something like that, meaning users, number of people in the office. And usually those types of companies don't have an on-site IT person. So for us, we find that the Long Island community is perfect for the managed services that we offer. Uh, they embrace it, they understand it, the, and that's, that's really why Long Island's a perfect place to do this kind of business. Um, so, you know, in addition, there are a number of organizations on Long Island that have IT people, single IT people, maybe one or two IT person, uh, I, I, person IT staff. And in those cases, we can really help those organiza organizations too. I mean, they, they don't have necessarily the depth of experience, the breadth of, of experience that we have. We've seen lots of things. Most times we find that IT people in a, in a mid-sized organization, they've been there for a very long time. They only know their own network, and they can really benefit from partnering with a company like us to show them other ways to do things and other opportunities in technology. Yeah, that's terrific. You talked, up, you talked about a risk assessment that you guys will, will conduct. Talk a little bit more about that. What does that entail? What do you guys do? What are you looking for? What companies should you know, be on the phone today calling you guys and saying we need this? What, what is it designed to do and what do you look at? Yeah, so the risk assessment would be based off of the need that they have to do the first of all to do the risk assessment. So the 
initially when we get clients to come to us to have us perform a risk assessment, they are forced to do the risk assessment, whether it's through HIPAA compliance, Department of Defense with DFARS, the new uh, New York State Department of Financial Services ruling that came down. So we get those to come in and PCI compliance. But we always say, as any organization out there should be doing a risk assessment and understanding where there are holes in their security uh, and risks to their business, you know, up front and not being a backseat driver to not understanding, you know, where are these risks. We call it a risk assessment, kind of like turning the lights on, right? Seeing what's going on within the room um, and not just with a flashlight, you know, we turn them all on. So we come in, uh, we do the uh, physical site review, seeing, hey, how are you even storing yourself? How's your server room? How, where are you putting paper documents? Is it locked? Or do you have policies in place to control how things are moved around? Obviously, we're going to come in from the technical standpoint, looking at it from <clears throat> the network on site, looking to see if something can get in from the outside, external threats, looking to see if there's things inside that could be an internal threat within the organization, understanding where data is, especially with the new buzzword out there that everyone's hearing about is the GDPR. It's understanding where your EU citizens' data is stored. A lot of times we walk in there and they have no idea one, if they're even supposed to be compliant, and two, where all that data is. So doing the discovery, finding out where everything is, finding out those risks, putting together a plan, a mitigation plan, um, to, to work through all those vulnerabilities, rated, of course, from a high critical level, medium to a low level of uh, risk, and then going through that. And then in addition, we work with guys at uh, companies like you, uh, we're handling the administrative piece, the policy procedure review. We're technical people. We're not good at deciphering the law and what policies and procedures should be. So working with, with you guys and coming up with those, the plan to review their policy procedures, make the changes to the policy procedures. At the end, we give back this report that shows everything and lets them know where they stand on the risk front. What do you guys think about cyber insurance for business, right? Now, I'll, I'll tell you that I'm not a big fan of it because I think just like homeowners insurance, they, they take out the stuff that really is the, the biggest risk, and they won't insure it. So, you know, it's like it's like living on the water and not right. having flood insurance. But how critical is is cyber insurance in your guys' experience? And maybe the industry is getting better. I don't know. But how do you feel? Is that part of the process? Do you do you talk to the business owner about having insurance in place, or do you leave yeah. that to, to to the lawyers? How does that work? We we do. We definitely leave it to the lawyers to help guide them. Um, you're right, 100. percent There's policies out there that really don't cover anything. Um, there are policies that do cover what you need. Um, a lot of people can get a false level of security with their uh, yeah. policies. Say, oh, I got $5 million, but then when you read about it, it only covers $50,000 worth of ransomware attack. And if it's from a nation state and it's proven, that's not even going to be covered. So you really have to look at the cyber policy. And I would say about three years ago, the whole insurance industry was like kind of the wild, wild west, and everybody was putting together policies, and there really was no formal understanding of where the business was in regards to their risk. There wasn't even a risk assessment done to see what they were insuring, if they even had the proper tools in place to secure the themselves. So we see a shift in that. We see the, the insurance companies you know, requiring a, a review, a risk assessment of the, the organization, um, but it really, you have to look at those policies, and you have to have somebody look at those policies who understands how to interpret them. Yeah, I'm glad that the industry is moving along on that, because the few policies, when we had clients that asked us to take a look at it, mm -hmm. it was they were so watered down that it was yeah. just, mm -hmm. and it's heartbreaking, because yeah. they, they, they don't know what to do. Let's shift for a minute, Marty, the, uh, the business, the business as, a, as a whole. So you guys are buying this, uh, this beautiful building. Right. It might be too small. I'm, t I'm telling you, I'm, I'm nervous that you guys are just buying something that's just too small at this point. But, but we'll get there, right? We'll get there. That'll be a good problem to have. That will. I think, um, I think you guys have partnered with the Suffolk County IDA on the purchase. Is that correct? We I'm, have. I They've been very helpful in us finding ways to save money and save on taxes and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I want to give them good. a shout out. I mean, uh, Tony uh, Catapano and uh, Kelly Morris over there, do they do a terrific, terrific job. Yes, definitely. And they've been, like I said, instrumental in helping us understand what opportunities exist. So where's the growth? So you talked about your managed services, and I get that. That's your core business. You have cyber, which is a necessary part of your business now. Where do you see, where do you see growth? What trends and where do you see the growth coming? 
Well, like I said earlier, I do think there's going to be more and more shops that have small IT uh, organization inside uh, that need us to help them with services that they just don't have the ability to perform, whether whether it's they don't have the resources because and they don't have the time, or maybe they don't have the experience and they need companies like us to help them along. There's there's so many different new technologies out there that maybe they didn't get it, haven't had a chance to see or understand. We come in and we can help them with that. So we're seeing more and more IT professionals come to us for services. So I think the managed services part of it will continue to grow and, it, and we're seeing that. And we're also, like I said, seeing more and more IT people coming to us for what we call a la carte services. Yeah, so you guys got to up your game <coughs> because it happened with lawyers when, when pre-internet, you know, we were the, uh, the cloistered with the secret books that had all the secret mm -hmm. answers. The internet, now everybody yeah. has transparency. If right. you're working with IT professionals that are in-house to begin with, that your staff has to up its game at that point, right? We do. I, you know, I mean, we have the best and brightest IT professionals around now. Uh, and we're attracting more and more all the time. So we're we're in a really good, solid position to support really any uh, organization that comes our way for services. So yes, we have to up our game, but again, every single day we're out on those lines experiencing new technology. So yeah. it really puts us in a, in a good position to understand these things. Yeah, you really have an impressive team. The knowledge mm -hmm. and the experience is what really um, attracted me to want to get to know you guys better because it's all about it's all about talent and one of the challenges that all Long Island businesses have be it you know whether it's IT engineering law accounting is attracting and retaining talent here on Long Island right? yes we're so close to the city we're so close to where they're just paying more dollars mm -hmm. so wh how are you guys doing it because you, you are attracting and keeping phenomenal talent how are you guys doing that we, we have a recruiting team, so we're out there every single day, and whenever there's uh, you know job fairs and things like that, we set our booth up and we go. We have a great relationship with Stony Brook University, so a lot of the younger people that are coming our way are coming from Stony Brook and Farmingdale. And, and I would say it's just a matter of working hard every single day to make sure we're out there finding the talent that's available. Yeah, even just to add on to that, today uh, the email got sent around. We just started four new interns for the summer, just got onboarded this morning. And they were walking around the office getting introductions, and it starts with that so they could see uh, an operation like mm -hmm. Flexible and, and how we're handling the IT needs of, of these businesses. And, you know, we're, we're attracting these these recent college grads, but we're also attracting the seasoned veterans who've been out there, whether they've been in an IT company, uh, a competitor of ours, or if they were internal IT and just wanted to have a different vision of what is out there for them. So it's... Yeah, I, I, it's a smart move because you guys have to have that, that mix. You've got to have this young, smart talent that's going to grow. Plus, they just have a different, totally different perspective than the way things always have been yep. done. They're going to come up with new ways to do it, and you've got to have that... You got to have that talent. Um, millennial generation. So a lot of talk is, uh, especially on this show, businesses trying to adapt their business to be able to keep uh, attracting younger, younger talent. Mm -hmm. Again, it's you know, the city, Brooklyn, Hoboken. All these areas are trying to be very trendy because that's where the talent is gonna is gonna be. What have you guys done? I think you've done some pretty cool stuff in your old space. What have you guys done? What are you going to do? How are you, how are you handling the millennials? Old guys like us, Marty, we've got to change the way we think. You know? Well, you do, and you have to have an understanding of what they want. And you know, we're seeing that most of the millennials want to come in and feel that they can make a difference and that whatever efforts they put forth, they understand why they're putting them forth and what, is going to, what the results are going to be. And, and we, that's really exciting because these, these young people can maybe, like you just said, find a different way to do things that we didn't even think about. Yep. And now all of a sudden, you know, maybe it's a whole new department that, we're, uh, that we have available for our clients to use. So um, from the perspective of keeping them, we try to, we try to give them um, various amenities and that sort of thing in terms of, you know, they can bring, uh, not an amenity, but one of the things that the, the kids are allowed to do or all of us are allowed to do, we have Pet Monday. So that, you know, people like that, the, the, the young people like to be able to pets? bring. Yeah, no cats. <laughs> no, no. 
Who <laughs> said no? I should say Dog Monday. But um, just dog. So, yeah, no ferrets. Dog, dog Day Monday. We we have uh, pot beautiful pigs. No, none of no, well no, maybe no, no, potbelly no. pigs, just no cats. <laughs> we, so we um that you know we have some beautiful space in our backyard. You've seen it yeah. for uh, barbecues and, and that kind of thing. Um, we have a. Uh, a pretty good uh, work-life balance, so we, we try to make sure that people come in, do their job, and get out, and we understand that that's a big part of what people are looking for. Um, Even so, to the know. point of, so one of the things that Flexible did a couple of years ago is uh, volunteer time off, so mm -hmm. allowing every employee to get uh, PTO hours back by volunteering their time to uh, help out in the community. And we've seen that with the, all of them, even, I mean, myself, I, I use it to coach my, uh, my son's little league team. But you see it across. Everyone's going back out there uh, and helping the community locally. And then we come back, they share the stories back with us. And it's actually a really cool thing. Um, and it's just another little piece that we've added uh, over the years to try to make it have a better life work balance to give them things. We also have bubble hockey, which is very important. So there's a couple of tournaments uh, going on over there where they play each other and stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I love is people will say, pe people, especially when they're struggling in their business, they'll say, well, what are these guys doing? How are they growing, right? And any time you peel back the onion on a company that's doing as well as you guys are doing, right, it's the same thing. We hire really smart people, we work hard, we invest in our employees, we invest in our community, you know, we try and give great service, we make sure we're responsive, everything everybody knows they're supposed to be doing, and when you actually do it, you know, here you are uh, 34 years later saying, well, what are you saying? You must be saying, how the hell did we get here? You know, it's a great place, right? Yeah, it's a great place to be, and, and you're really right. It's really understanding exactly what uh, your employees need from you and, and then giving it to them and that's that's what we do. We want to really make Flexible the best workplace on the island. We want people to really enjoy being there and, and staying. That's, that's what we want. Do you guys get competition? Like is it more cool to be in the cyber team than it is the managed services team? So you get like that's competition a, now? Is that what goes on? That's a good question. Good question. It happens in my head. Cyber's cool. I guess cool, cyber's right? cool, yeah. And, and it's like, like uh, yeah, it's cool but the managed services are really paying the bills here guys let's right. not let's not forget that right you know so we're out of time unfortunately I could talk to you guys all day long this has really been incredible uh, give a shout out the company needs you and if you don't have them you need them company needs you Marty how are they getting in touch with you they are going to our website www.flexiblesystems.com uh, and they can find all the appropriate phone numbers and every other way to get in contact with us that's great folks you heard it here Marty Schmidt Kevin Edwards flexible Greatest IT folks on Long Island. Happy to have them here. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, Thank you, Joe. Joe. Great. Thank Absolutely. you very much.